good afternoon, all. Uh, thank you to, for inviting me. Thank you, Minister, uh, uh, for those uh, inspiring words. Uh, absolutely appropriate about what, what's happening in Africa right now. And I thank the Institute for inviting me, for Irish Aid, uh, for having me uh, give this talk this afternoon. Uh, the title of my talk is, is about Africa, so pathways to inclusive, sustainable development, of which the, the private sector plays a, a part. Let, let me start off this way. You know, we, we have a view of, uh, of Africa, because that's our mandate. But also we have a view of the world, because we believe the world is impacting on, on Africa. So what we see globally, uh, certainly what I see, is the convergence of three crises, what I call a perfect storm. So what you have is, a, initially we had a banking crisis, that's one, um, and now we've got a sovereign debt crisis, it's become more evident, and, and third, we have a crisis of low growth and no jobs. So three, three things coming together is what we call a perfect storm, and so we watch, and we've seen the, what, is, what, what took place in Europe this week, uh, the whole uh, deal at which the Greeks have decided to do a referendum on uh, interest. I don't think uh, that's, uh, that's probably will be helpful in the short term, but we hope that thing, things uh, turn, turn out okay. And what we see basically is, is, is Europe um, uh, focusing more on stabilization, which it should, to stabilize the, the situation, and less on growth and structural reforms. I guess that, that would be the second phase, and that's what is, is, is required. All of that is impacting on, on Africa. But I must say that uh, Africa is, is, is looking okay. And in my talk, uh, I'm, I'm, I'll have uh, three sections, uh, uh, which is what Africa looks like now, what will it look like going forward, we go 50 years and so forth, and what are the challenges and what's the, what, what's the different roles uh, as a bank uh, for us, what, what should we be doing and what should our partners uh, be, be doing. Now, if, 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 if you look, take a look at this chart, you'll see that Africa has been the third fastest growing region uh, in the world after uh, uh, Asia, really in the Middle East. So it's done very well in the last 10 years. And in fact, coming out of the financial crisis, Africa was growing at something like 6.2%, and it dipped to about 2.6% in 2009, and then it came back up. Uh, and, and last year we recorded 4.9%, and this year we expect something like 5.7%, and next year an average rate of growth of the order of more 6.1%, 6 above six again. So quite robust, resilient growth uh, in the last 10 years. And I think that has got to do with the, some of the partners who have uh, done a good job in, in helping Africa. I must say that African, the African economy is still small, by the way, by global standards. Its size is about 1.7 trillion. Uh, I'm going to use American dollars, uh, because we, that's what we use. <laughs> and which is the same size as the whole of Brazil or, or Russia. Uh, but the population is, is, is a billion people, at least. So population, economic size, you can see that. The, the income per capita can only be smaller <laughs> by, by, by definition. So, and, and what's been missing in this strong growth in Africa um, is really what I call inclusion, inclusive growth, which is really explains the Arab Spring. And it's including inclusion in many dimensions. I'll, I'll, I'll come to this in, in a moment. So it's good growth, strong growth, but not inclusive enough. Um, where, does, where, where, where is African growth coming from? It's partly a commodity story. We've got a lot of countries in Africa with oil and gas, various minerals and so forth, uh, with the commodity boom, the commodity super cycle. That's been driving a lot of the growth uh, in Africa. However, the commodity story does not explain 30% of the growth in Africa. What explains it is the domestic market. Is the domestic market. You have, had a, uh, you, you have got a, a, a burgeoning uh, <coughs> middle class in Africa coming through. I'll show you a slide later. We've just done a paper which has become very popular. We estimate that the middle class in Africa is about 300 million people, which is 30%. However, I hasten to say, only half of that is stable mid middle class. The other half is unstable. Those people could fall back into poverty very quickly due to any shock, be it political uh, you know, shocks, uh, governance issues, uh, loss, loss of a job, a uh, death in the family. Uh, but that, that 300 million people is responsible for the domestic demand that, that, that is growing uh, in Africa. Certainly, if you speak to a lot of the companies in the consumer sector, they'll tell you that their biggest margins uh, are probably in Africa uh, and nowhere else because you know, of, of this class of people. Um, 
but also a lot of African countries have done very well in terms of managing their economies. I think the one thing that's often missed in my view, uh, when, we, when we analyze the structural adjustment that took place in Africa in the 80s, where everyone concluded that it didn't work, there was no growth. Uh, what we forgot is that the, it takes time, it takes time, and I think the fruits of structural adjustment is only showing now. And it's, 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 and it's, it's likely about the quality of people that it produced who are running central banks, who are running ministers of finance, good economic managers is what really came out of the structural uh, reforms in Africa. <laughs> um, also agriculture in some, some parts of Africa is doing well. Um, the, the more needs to be done here. I think, without, I think that with Africa, if, if you don't deal with the issue of land title, some kind of ownership rights, the way Vietnam did, we we'll never make progress on agriculture. And this is where 65% of Africans live. They live in, on, on agriculture. We'll never make progress. But again, it's a very difficult space. In my view, it's very political. Sometimes it's strongly cultural. The chiefs have something to say in it in terms of rural land ownership. It's very complex, not, not easy. But if, if we don't deal with it, we'll never get Africans uh, quickly enough out, 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 out of poverty. Now, this is, my, this is the revolution slide. Uh, uh, if just an example of, of, of inclusive growth that's been missing in Africa. If you take, if you take the, the green bars from 1984 to 2010, they show you the rate of unemployment in Tunisia, averaging 14%. Um, and this is what a lot of people were tracking, you know, it's stable, well, it's 14%, might go down at some point. But what, what people were not focusing on, including ourselves, is the, is the yellowish, uh, light yellowish bar where it shows the unemployment of university graduates, which is rising from 2.3 to 84 to 20 percent, if not higher now. Now we think it's not more like 30 percent, and, and that's your revolution <laughs> taking place. Educated people, smart people, who, who you know who don't have jobs. Uh, this is a problem. So, so our our growth has not been been inclusive at all. Now, now I would say inclusion is, is an issue. The other issue around this growth in Africa is the political uh, you know, back, backdrop to it. The, the, the voice and accountability is a problem in Africa. That was the issue with Ben Ali in Egypt, in Libya, and everywhere uh, else. Uh, the issue, whole issue of the youth bulge uh, uh, is, is an issue. So while Africa is growing, there are risks. And, and the risks around uh, inclusive uh, growth in this component. Just some of the growth figures uh, um, for a few African countries. We estimate that this year the fastest growing country is going to be Ghana, growing at least at 12%. People tell me that 12% is conservative. Uh, so Ghana, they've discovered oil as well, so that that helps. And then Ethiopia, growing at uh, 10%. Uh, doesn't anyone know how many people there are in Ethiopia? This is amazing. This is the first time the question has been answered, no hesitation. <laughs> if I ask the same question in Africa, in Africa, people say, oh, 10 million? But in Ireland, 80 million. It's actually 85 million. <laughs> 85 million. The, the point I'm making is that the, 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 the earlier point I was making about this middle of the pyramid, this 30% of the African population, is partly responsible for Ethiopia's 10% rate of growth. If you've been to Addis Ababa of late and you're watching the the, the buildings that are uh, mushroom all over the place is partly domestic investors, but a lot of the Ethiopian diaspora itself. So it's an investment-driven uh, uh, growth. Uh, some people say we doubt the figure and so forth, but but if you go to Ethiopia, you'll see that it's really growing strongly. Uh, some of the countries that are growing strongly, you see the DRC, that's a resource effect. Zimbabwe, that's a, a pure economic recovery uh, effect, and then South Africa. Uh, uh, Showing a more, uh, you know, muted growth there, three point six percent, quite low. Uh, and, you know, Nigeria six point nine percent, and then Ivory Coast uh, because of the of the standoff, political standoff, growing at a negative seven percent, and then up up north where we live uh, in Tunisia one point one, Libya uh, uh, minus uh, nineteen percent, and Egypt one point six percent. Uh, so so it's, it's almost like a twin track Africa, North Africa growing with negative rate of growth, this is the revolution, and then Sub-Saharan Africa growing uh, much strongly uh, with average of about 5.5% uh, rate of growth. So overall, uh, all, all okay. Intra-Africa trade is still weak, it's still about 12% of, you know, of, of trade with, with globally, it's, it's quite weak. 
And there are many reasons why uh, African countries don't trade with each other. It's about infrastructure, it's about weak manufacturing sectors. There are a lot of sectors, uh, factors, but clearly this is not a, a strong point. Uh, uh, regional integration is, is quite weak. Now, uh, this slide you can't see. What I've shown is, if, if the, the, you get the hard copy slides, just to show you progress has been made in Africa in different areas uh, in poverty reduction. Certainly poverty reduction, the progress has been made. There are fewer uh, poorer Africans than there were you know, 20 years ago. Uh, a progress on infrastructure development, certainly there has been an improvement. Uh, progress in the private sector and the business climate, there has been an improvement. If you look at the business climate, uh, if compared to where Africa was uh, uh, 10 years ago, uh, a lot has changed. There's still, uh, there still a lot to do. There's still a lot to do. It's not easy. Um, uh, infrastructure uh, improvement, regional inter integration, uh, very, very, very little. Uh, agriculture and food security, uh, small, small improvement. Otherwise, we wouldn't be having this problem in the Horn of Africa. Uh, uh, it's quite clear that the Horn of Africa issue is not so much about drought, but rather more about governance, because a, a shortage of food does not have to be a famine. <laughs> becomes a fair man if there's a governance failure. Somalia is the elephant in the room. I did another report about a few months ago on the issue of piracy. Uh, in, in, in fact, the CNN did a, something on it on, uh, last week on, 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 the, on the paper, which is highly costly. And it's, it's, it explains what's going on in the Horn of Africa. Gender and human development, uh, progress, it could, it could be better, frankly. Or, or governance and transparency, I'll show you a slide later. Africa has made uh, uh, progress in a lot of the governance uh, areas with the exception of voice and accountability. That, that, that's still a, a gap. And then uh, in terms of uh, political fragility, a uh, number of fragile states, again, there's been, been improvement all, overall. So, so it's all looking positive, but you know, things could be, could be faster. Uh, I think I'm, I'm going to uh, sk skip that, the, these slides. Now, the, the one area that I want to spend a few minutes on is on, is on infrastructure development. This is a big gap in Africa. The, the, we estimate that the Africa needs something like $93 billion a year worth of infrastructure investments from all the partners. C currently, only half of that is being funded. So easily $45 billion per year goes unfunded. And that is very costly to Africa. It's costing Africa something like three percentage points in GDP growth. So if you're just to close the infrastructure uh, gap, you just add another three percent to growth. Huge, it's a huge gap, and that gap is right across the, uh, the board. It's in, it's in, you know, uh, uh, length of paved roads, road density. Uh, it's still in telephony, uh, although a lot has been achieved in terms of mobile telephony. It's in generation capacity. In fact, in fact, we know that Africa loses some like thirty percent in productivity due to power outages. Just power outages, thirty percent of productivity gone. You know, it's, it's in water and sanitation. Uh, 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 right across the board, this is a big issue. And as a bank, uh, uh, almost 70% of our resources are invested in, in infrastructure of one form or another. Because we believe this is where change is going to come from. Uh, uh, <coughs> absolutely. Uh, then, then just some, some, some wonderful maps that we've, we've done. These are the missing, the red are the missing power lines in Africa. You know, green is what is in place. Red is the missing power lines. You know, right, right across, you know. So, so uh, is missing roads, no, no, yeah, that's missing power. Right? And then we have uh, uh, missing roads as well. We also map these, we know which roads need to be put in place, all the corridors and so forth. Uh, so, so, so there's a lot that needs to be done. Uh, even in terms of the uh, ICT, the, the, the missing cables, I think it's now going on to auto, uh, the, the missing cables, uh, both under sea, and uh, you know, or on the land, we should be put in place and have not been put in place. But, and some of these projects have already been scoped and been map mapped out. We have a whole database of which projects are, sh are ready for investment, uh, and, but the investment just isn't there to, to finance uh, these projects. But, we, but we, have whole, we have all the information at the bank. Um, I mentioned earlier about agriculture. I'm, I'm, I'm going to skip that. This is a useful picture on governance. You can see, if you just focus on the on the green line, uh, uh, there's no pointer. You can see that the biggest gap really is on, is on uh, uh, voice, voice and account accountability. This is where uh, Africa is not uh, doing, doing well. Uh, and perhaps if you are thinking of uh, intervening or, or, or in the whole political space, uh, uh, just making sure that civil society, governments are more accountable, this is where a lot of work needs, needs, needs to be done in our view. 
uh, but there's an improvement in other areas, in, uh, even issues, areas like corruption and, and so forth, government effectiveness, political stability, uh, you know, yeah. So, but, but, but this is the big one. Um, uh, the other issue where there's a, a gap, in, in, in my view, is whole ish, uh, area of science and technology, uh, higher education science and technology. If you look at the enrollments, uh, because no country can develop without investing in, in, in hard research, uh, or at least in, in, in some kind of vocational training in the, in the hard uh, uh, skills. You can see Southern Africa uh, and Africa lower than any OECD, East Asia, South Korea, Costa Rica is, is an example of a country. Uh, again, where work needs, needs to be done here. Um, now, now, I referred earlier to the, to the domestic economy, the domestic demand in Africa growing. Uh, this is an estimate, our estimate of the, the middle of the pyramid in, in, in Africa, or the middle class. It's been growing. Uh, you can see from 1980, was something like you know, about 28% to about 33% uh, at the end of last year. Um, and, and it's about 300 mi million people. They are responsible for, for quite a large part of consumption their own assets, and we've tried to measure this middle class from different angles in terms of what they consume, what they own, and what they save. We were coming up with the same figure, 300 million, of which half is stable, 150 is stable, the other 150 is unstable. Uh, uh, so so it, it's something to, uh, not, to be scoffed, you know, not to be scoffed at. I also want to mention something that has been um, uh, assisting uh, uh, you know, growth in Africa is the Africans uh, abroad, Africans not living outside their countries. Uh, we estimate that 64% of Africans do not live in their country. So they live, and 64% live in Africa. And then the, the remainder then live in other countries outside, uh, other regions outside Africa. Uh, um, and so, and, and these Africans, the African diaspora, send home something like $40 billion a year. $40 billion a year, and that's the same as the amount of ODA that Africa receives. In fact, if in, in foreign direct investment in Africa is usually of the order of $50 billion. So if you add the diaspora uh, remittances, plus the foreign direct investment, that's more than uh, ODA. Uh, but then what happens with, the, with the, the diaspora remittances is because they are never pulled together you send money to your family. Like, I still send my money, to my, family, my, my family some money. It's, it's directed, it's for education, or it's for supporting an elderly person. It's very, very directed, uh, very uh, private, uh, but it's not pooled. So its impact, therefore, is not, uh, what can I say, it's, it's not as, as a, you can't leverage it. You can't leverage it like you do with uh, the FDI or with ODA. You, you can't leverage it, but, but it's, it's, it's not to be scoffed at. It's, it's, it's a big chunk. And I think more effort should be made to see how uh, uh, this could be harnessed and pulled together so that it becomes an effective partner to ODA flows and FDI flows. I know that in Kenya, in their recent bond issue uh, for financing infrastructure, they've tapped into the, the diaspora uh, So, So that, 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 that's encouraging. Um, just the figures to show you what I was talking about. You know, remittances versus ODA, FDI. Uh, private debt and portfolio equity. This is a 208 figure, so it's a little bit outdated. But the ballpark is what it is for the first three. That, that's really the, the ballpark uh, uh, for, for Africa. Um, where do we think Africa is headed? Uh, uh, um, the, if you look at the, the current GDP of Africa, is something like $1.7 trillion. Uh, In 50 years' time, we estimate it to be about, about $15 trillion. 15 trillion, and we've plotted it every year all the way up to 50 years' time. That's where we think it is headed under the current growth conditions. Now, if, if you look at the, uh, the uh, per capita GDP, currently at below uh, $2,000 per person, in 50 years' time, we think it will be sitting at about just over 6,000, and it is still below South Korea's GDP, current South Korea's GDP per capita. South Korea is currently about, what, 17,000 or something. So Africa will only get to 6,000 uh, you know, in 50 years' time, unless we're able to, to, to uh, push uh, here and there to make sure that it, it accelerates. Um, population, uh, I think we've all been reading the, the UN population uh, report. Uh, uh, you can see currently 
uh, Africa has uh, just over a billion people. Um, and we think that in 50 years' time, the population will be more like 2.6 billion people. Basically, the, the, the extra people that will be added to the world between now and the next 50 years, half of those will come from Africa. So you can see that the potential population pressure that's going to come through. Uh, my team has just uh, uh, shown me a draft report, which I was reading as I was coming, which I'm still cleaning up, about the problem of the aging population in Africa. We never reflect on the aging issue in Africa. We estimate right now that 3.6% of the African population is over 65. So that, that's, that's already in that retirement age. And, that's, and over time, it's going to grow to as much as 10% over 50 years, 10 10%, which is your typical you know, uh, 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 percentage for uh, the, what you call the, the retirees in, in any society. I don't know what it is in Ireland. Is it as much as 10%? Maybe yeah, that's too high. But, so it's going to change a lot the dynamics of dependency uh, uh, going forward. Now, um, I, by region, the, the, the regions which will have the largest population are going to be East Africa and West Africa. East Africa and West Africa, very easily. Or, or, you know, that's where the, the, the bulk of the people are. Southern Africa, uh, uh, Central Africa, much, much, much lower. You can see those, those two compared to that. Big, yeah. that's where the, those are the big population areas in Africa. Now, our urban population, uh, currently the urban population is about 40% in Africa. In about 50 years, we think it's going to rise to closer to 80%. It will be more like what you see in Ireland or, or of that order. So think of the pressure that's going to build on these African systems that the minister was referring to, the, on infrastructure, on schools, on health. So a lot needs to be done to plan these African cities better. If, if it doesn't happen, this is what is more likely to happen over time. And it will put pressure on that. On, on facilities. Now, child mortality uh, rates, those, those will improve, absolutely. The AIDS death rates, again, we, we, we see an improvement over time. It's already shown, um, <coughs> absolutely. Uh, life expectancy, life expectancy. Our, our kind estimates is uh, that, currently we know that the average life expectancy in Africa is something like 55 years. In about 50 years' time, it's going to move to 70. So again, you can see the issue of the aging population, the whole dependency ratio. Uh, it has major implications on, in terms of investing in, 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 in contractual savings, your life companies and so forth. A lot of the African countries don't have an organized pension fund industry. The whole construction, uh, contractual savings space needs to, to, be, to be dealt with and dealt with quickly, in our view. Uh, literacy is going to improve a lot. It's going to move much closer to 90% uh, over time. So this is the Africa that we see going forward. And we've, by the way, we've produced a whole report on it, uh, which was reviewed in the Wall Street Journal two weeks ago. <laughs> you know, it says, uh, Africa in 50 years' time, the road towards inclusive growth. There's a lot. It's a very interesting paper. I, 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 if I think I did send it, I hope it will be circulated to whoever wants to see it. it it's free. You know, we're not going to charge you for it. <laughs> Right. But uh, in, in the, now I'm just going to double back in my third part of the presentation, looking at the development challenges. And I'm going to be repeating here, but I'll try to move faster. It's infrastructure. That's a big challenge for Africa. As a bank, we'll focus on it. Another issue is, it really has to do with how Africa manages what we call these new emerging partners, China, Russia, India, Brazil, Turkey, South Korea, and so forth. Uh, they're certainly sources of, of dynamism, of energy, uh, of, of, of exports, uh, trading activity, and so forth. Uh, but Africa does need a strategy to manage these, these relationships more effectively for maximum benefit. Certainly, regional integration is a challenge that Africa, again, must you know, uh, uh, fo focus on. On regional integration, I think that perhaps, uh, rather than focusing on the trading of goods and services, there's an issue about uh, people movement. A lot needs to be done about that movement of people. And then the others about movement of capital, making sure that those two can move freely, that will do a lot uh, to buttress the regional integration uh, pillar. Uh, uh, <coughs> improving the investment climate is something that, 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 that needs, still needs, needs to be done. A lot has been achieved, uh, more needs to be done. And then promoting what I call direct domestic investment. I think it's one thing to be focused on foreign direct investment and then governments forget about developing the local entrepreneurs who become you know, credible partners for the foreign investors, you know, for JVs and so forth. Again, a lot needs to be done in, in, in domestic direct investment. 
and SM, SMEs, we have estimated uh, uh, in, in, in some study we've done uh, that they're about uh, 65 million small to medium scale enterprises in Africa. And if you were to put a market value on them, their value would be something like $450 billion, which is about a quarter of Africa's gross domestic product. And that makes a lot of sense because you, we know that at least 25% of economic activity in Africa comes from the informal sector, from this SME sector. It's a sector that needs a lot of support. Uh, the bulk of African <laughs> people survive and, and, and live on it. Um, certainly, another issue is economic transformation, especially for countries that are resource rich. Uh, Botswana, uh, Nigeria, uh, DRC. A lot needs to be done to develop other sectors other than the natural resources uh, that, that uh, are driving the, the, the economy. Again, I've talked earlier about the issue of the population growth. Uh, uh, how, to, how should Africa balance this demographic, demographic dividend, which is creating a, a stable middle class overall over time uh, with poverty reduction challenges? Because if you have population growth, growth uh, you have uh, poverty coming through very quickly uh, if growth is not coming through in, in, to, to support uh, the population growth. The issue of whole inclusive growth and youth unemployment Higher education, vocational skills is something that needs to be looked at. F financial inclusion, we're very encouraged by what we see in Kenya with the uh, uh, development of the M-Pesa uh, uh, you know, uh, technology uh, uh, where people are able to move money uh, using mobile telephony and, and so forth. Uh, to me, that's something that should be promoted, but we know that uh, it's not easy to manage the risks. Uh, it's a new way of banking, so naturally it presents uh, us with regulatory challenges uh, but if those can, can be overcome, it's one way to really bring people uh, into the financial sector. I've talked earlier about agriculture. That I, here, I really feel that if we, as long as we don't deal with some kind of uh, with some kind of, 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 of property rights entitlements, which is very difficult to deal with, we can't make much progress on in the agricultural sector. All we can do is support here and there, but I'm not certain we can make make a lot of progress uh, on, on domestic resource mobilization. Uh, uh, African countries lose a lot uh, from companies that evade taxes, individuals that evade taxes, uh, mining companies and so forth. Uh, but, but, but also, uh, we know that Afri African countries can do more to deepen their capital markets because these are also source of, a source of domestic uh, resources. As I say, I'm very encouraged by what I see in Kenya in terms of deepening capital markets, getting the bond market going. Uh, 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 you know, uh, launching infrastructure bonds for targeted infrastructure. All that is welcome. Certainly as a bank, this is something that, that we like to support. And, and think about it, you know, for, for every dollar uh, that Africa receives in ODA, Africa itself raises $10. So there is something there to, to work with, something to work with. There's a big potential. Uh, if Africa is getting something like four, $40 billion in ODA, itself is raising something like $400 billion. And more, and more could, uh, could, could, could be done. The second point is about, is about natural resources. I think that uh, African countries must uh, put in place uh, or develop sovereign wealth funds if they've got natural resources. Botswana has done an excellent job in that. Uh, that that's already a model to follow. Uh, other countries like Gabon, uh, Nigeria, now you've got Uganda come, coming through. They should all uh, uh, develop or put in place sovereign wealth funds so that these, the revenues from natural resources are managed transparently. And then you can do a three-way asset allocation, which is support the current expenditure you know, for, for, from the revenues. Number two, invest in infrastructure. Number three, lock away a portion for future generations, which is tucked away somewhere. You know, so so, so th that is my, I feel very strongly about this point about uh, uh, you know, how natural resources are managed in Africa. Uh, it, it can't be that you know, natural, having natural resources is a curse, always a curse, it can't be. Surely it's an opportunity. Um, dealing with the illicit financial flows, I've already referred to piracy as a big issue. Just to give you an example, the direct and indirect cost of piracy in, in the uh, Seychelles is something like 4% of GDP. Everything, with tourism, fisheries, uh, cost of insurance, and all of that. It's, it's huge. It's a big issue that should be dealt with. Um, leveraging ODA for private sector support. I think, I think it's time to reflect on how 
the African private sector or whoever is investing in the private sector in Africa can work with uh, uh, ODA to, to leverage, uh, to get more uh, uh, for, 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 for development. It may even be worth from time to time considering uh, ODA as some kind of insurance. It only comes in when a specific event uh, occurs, what is called an insurance uh, uh, approach. Um, so these are the issues that we think uh, should be done in Africa, given the scenario of where Africa is right now, where it is most likely to be in 50 years time, and what we think needs, needs to be done uh, uh, to, to, to get there. Let me stop here for now, and I'm happy to take questions. <laughs>